Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, it's a great pleasure to come back to UBC. I think this is my fourth or fifth um, visit back to uh, uh, to UBC, and most of the time, you know, every time I was here, it was either to attend a conference organized by Tsering or by um, Professor Chen Jinghua. So it's a great pleasure for me to be back at UBC, especially to introduce my work on uh, Buddhism and law. I want to thank especially Tsering, you know, for inviting me through the Himalayan um, program to be here, and mm. I'm also grateful to uh, Professor Chen Jinghua and also many other members from the Department of Asian Studies and also the uh, Tianzhu Network for um, Buddhist Studies for making my visit to UBC this time possible. So my work, um, as you already or already know, focuses on the intersection of Buddhism and law. And in particular, in my work, I use um, textual analysis to understand the transnational transmission and reception of Buddhist legal knowledge and practices from India to China and Tibet. In my presentation today, um, it will be based on my current book project, and this is known as Buddhists in Court, the Legal Governance of Buddhism in China. And the key question that animates this research project is this. How did the um, Buddhist clergy and the state negotiate for the two legal systems of the Buddhist monastic law and the state law to coexist in one society? My interest in this project actually began with um, you know, an interesting observation when I noticed contradictory depictions about what can happen to misbehaving or sometimes criminal monks and nuns in classical Chinese literature. Um, in many classical Chinese literature, Buddhism was often depicted as a religion capable of providing sanctuary to criminals facing prosecution from the state. Um, one most well-known example is this, The Water Margin. You know, this is a 14th century um, classical Chinese novel. Lu Zhishen, the uh, flowery monk, who is portrayed here in um, half-naked and also tattooed in a 19th century Japanese depiction here, he had killed a person, but he was able to avoid punishment by becoming ordained in a monastery on Mount Wutaishan. Yet elsewhere, if you look elsewhere, the journals of retired magistrates in China suggest a different story. And you know, these journals of retired magistrates suggest that ordained Buddhist offenders often receive harsher, treat, uh, harsher punishments for being a monk or nun offender. So um, for instance, we can find numerous stories in this text, and this is known as um, Conversation with Friends at Yunxi, Yunxi Youyi, and this is a collection of private writings by the Tang writer um, Fan Shu. So in this text, for example, we can see that um, for lending high interest um, loans, monk Tong, whose name was Tong, was punished by um, 10 blows of a beating with the heavy stick, and he was also exiled outside of the circuit. And for drinking alcohol in a brothel, and also for killing and cooking chicken and goose, the two Buddhist monks, Changman and Zhizhen, um, was punished with a penalty of 30 blows of beating with the heavy stick, which is a zhang, and that caused their deaths. And also sometime between 854 and 859, some monk in Yueyang uh, received a penalty of 30 blows of beating with the heavy stick for fishing and slaughtering cattle. And an unspecified monk, uh, whose, um, whose name was unknown, also received um, 15 blows of beating with the light stick for fighting with another person. And eventually for, um, uh, for gambling, for participating in gambling, a monk by the name of Yunyan was drowned in the river. So therefore, you know, if you look at these um, classical Chinese uh, sources, on the one hand, Stories like the flowery monk Lu Zhishen suggest that a lay person can obtain clerical immunity by becoming an ordained Buddhist monk in a Buddhist monastery to avoid punishment on pre-ordination crimes. Yet, on the other hand, if you look at the stories from the conversations with friends at Yunqi, it tells us a different scenario because these texts illustrate how ordained Buddhist offenders often receive harsher but not more lenient um, treatment from the lay officials. And I've been wrestling with these contradictions for a long time until I, I encountered researches on benefit of clergy. So what is this? And this is a clerical privilege extended to Christian priests um, in England beginning in the 12th century and eventually it was abolished 
in the 19th century. The benefit of clergy, what does it do? It allows um, clerical offenders in the Christian tradition to avoid prosecution in the court of the king, but instead they can uh, request to be tried in the um, ecclesiastical court operated by the church, where they can oftentimes uh, expect to receive um, a less um, severe treatment or uh, conviction. So my reading on the benefit of a clergy for Christian priests has thus inspired me to explore the question that I want to talk about in my presentation today, and that is, do Buddhist, ordained Buddhists have clerical immunity from the state law? So in other words, when an ordained Buddhist monk or nun commits a crime or offense punishable by the state law, will they be immune from punishment or will be treated with more leniency because of their religious identity? My examination of the Buddhist legal and non-legal materials that I will show you today will show you that at least ordained Buddhists have tried to obtain such a clerical um, privilege. So in what follows, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to discuss an ordained Buddhist's legal rights, restrictions, and privileges as both the plaintiff when they are the victim in a case and also as the defendant when, when they are the offender uh, in a case as regulated in Indian Buddhist literature. And after that, I will also discuss the reception of these regulations in both China and Tibet. And in conclusion, I want to argue that the earlier suggestion by the Buddhist studies scholar uh, Zhang Natie, who argues that the Buddhist campaign for clerical immunity from corporal penalty is a Chinese invention devoid of Indian origin. And this argument is no longer tenable because discussions on clerical immunity for ordained Buddhists had already been uh, documented and recorded in the earlier Indian Buddhist literature that I will show tonight. So the central policy in regulating how ordained Buddhists can defend their legal rights as the plaintiff or victim in uh, a legal uh, dispute is this. And basically the central message is do not, do not litigate don't start a lawsuit, and that's the advice. And the redactors of the Buddhist monastic law text were um, unanim unanimous in their position that ordained Buddhists should not initiate lawsuits under any circumstance in the lay court, especially you know, lawsuits against individuals outside of the Buddhist clergy. And to illustrate the necessity um, for this, and these redactors of Buddhist monastic law text presented five different cases in the Buddhist canon law following the tradition of the Pali, the Sarvastivadin, Mahishasaka, Dhammaguptaka, Mahasangika, and also the Mula Sarvastivada traditions. In other words, you know, these cases were um, can be found in all the uh, extant traditions of Buddhist monastic law texts. And in these texts, you know, these cases documented um, cases where um, ordained Buddhists had sued lay persons over issues such as land disputes, donated property, property damage, and also even sexual assault. In all of these cases, um, the redactors of the different Buddhist monastic law text, they concur to strictly prohibit ordained Buddhists from taking civil action against any lay person in the lay court. And this applied to all lay persons, you know, either they are householders, offsprings and siblings of the householders, or slaves, workmen, or even if they were hermits um, staying on the mountain. And the rationale, so basically this text is, you know, this text are telling ordained Buddhists, don't sue anybody ever again in the lay court. And the rationale for this prohibition is not difficult to understand, because for a lay person, um, an ordain when an ordained Buddhist wins a lawsuit in the lay court, it will entail more than the loss of what was under dispute, either be it donated property or property damage. Such consequences for the loss might include additional financial or corporal punishment or other unnecessary hard hardship. And the redactors of the Buddhist canon law text dramatized some of these dire possibilities using five cases um, presented in the, you know, in a number of texts that, you know, that are listed here. So in these cases, the central plot is this. Um, a donor who had previously donated a property to some Buddhist nuns passed away, he died. And when he died, his son 
went to talk to the Buddhist nuns and he wanted to uh, reclaim the ownership of the donated property. And of course the Buddhist nuns refused to give it back to him. So the nuns sued the son of the deceased donor in the lay court. So the version recorded in one text, the Sarvastivada Vinaya, informs us that the verbal dispute between the nun and the son of the deceased donor very quickly escalated to physical assault because um, you know, one, um, one nun from a Brahman family, previously from a Brahman family, he, she argued very aggressively with the, um, the son of the donor. And so the son of the donor beat the, the nun, and there's consequence to that, and I will tell you in, um, in a moment. The other case that we find in the, um, the uh, Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya records a Buddhist nun's accusation of a lay person for sexual assault. So the story is this, I, um, at one, on one night when the Buddhist nun was sharing the living room uh, of a lay person with some other lay um, visitors, she went out in the middle of the dark night um, to use bathroom and then when she came back, she came to the wrong bed where a layman was sleeping. So the moment she sat on the bed, the layman rose up and caught the hand of the nun and because of that, um, the nun then accused the, um, the lay person for sexually assaulting her. So in both of these two cases, right, you know, in the previous case, a lay person uh, beat the nun, and in the second case, uh, the lay person touched, accidentally touched the hand of the nun. In both cases, the Buddhist nun sued both of them in the lay court. The punishment for um, a lay defendant, if they are convicted, could vary between, between confiscation of property, imprisonment, or amputation of limbs. The most dramatic um, penalty to be imposed on the losing lay defendant is found in the, um, um, the text that I've already mentioned in the Sarva Sitvada Vinaya. And in this text, um, the, the lay person who had beaten the nun received a punishment, and the punishment was to cut his right hand off because he used that hand to beat the nun. And similarly, the layman who touched the nun in the Mula Sarvasivara Vinaya also lost his case. And um, similarly, the hand that he used to accidentally touch the nun was also cut off when he lost the case. So therefore, as you can tell, you know, the cases I've analyzed above indicate that the serious concern among the redactors of the Buddhist monastic law text, um, you know, it's this, because for them, litigation in the lay court initiated by ordained Buddhists could become a major source of criticism against the ordained Buddhist plaintiffs. It could also damage the Buddhist clergy's relationship with the lay community because the, um, the monastic community relies on donations from the lay community to survive. And furthermore, to allow ordained Buddhists to litigate in the, in the lay courtroom could also ruin the Buddhist clergy's corporate image in disputes with non-Buddhist um, practitioners. And if we, if we move on, when ordained Buddhists are the defendant in an offense, that means they are the, um, the offender, you know, the one who had wronged others, we must distinguish between two types of offenses, and these are the um, pre-ordination and post-ordination offenses. For pre-ordination offenses, the redactors of the Buddhist monastic law text perceived the Buddhist clergy as an entity that could function as a sanctuary where criminals could join the clergy as to become ordained monks or nuns so that they can avoid punishment for their crimes. With the exception of the Mahasangika Vinaya, like, you know, the redactors of these monastic texts, they portrayed Indian kings in the Buddhist monastic law text as the ultimate judge who would be willing to arbitrarily exempt criminals who had committed crimes before joining the Buddhist clergy. And some of them would, would even justify such exemptions using um, an existing law and sometimes these Indian kings were perceived as someone who would willingly bend existing laws to rule in favor of the accused you know, newly ordained Buddhist monks and nuns. Um, Okay, let me see, let me, um, because of time, I will only share with you one example that, um, that we can find in the Sarvastivada Vinaya. So in this text, a lay woman faced a death penalty because she was disobedient to her husband. 
and her husband threatened to kill her. So she joined, decided to join the Buddhist nuns order to escape from death. Um, the woman's husband, in this case, you know, was not just an ordinary lay person. He was um, a very brave warrior who had fought and won many battles for King Prasenajit. And for his reward, this warrior husband requested from the king, uh, requested his permission to kill his wife. And so because of that, you know, the wife fled and joined the, um, the, uh, the nuns order. And one of the young warriors, you know, who was accompanying her husband, uh, hunting for this wife, so made the following suggestion. And he said, let us cut all the Buddhist nuns into halves with the knife in the shape of a cow's tongue. And hearing this, one of the senior warrior objected and insisted that they should inquire, make an inquiry to the, to the king because the king is perceived as the protector of the Buddhist monastic community. So before the warriors went to see the king, some Buddhist nuns reported this matter to Queen Malika, who then informed the king Prasenajit. So pr King Prasenajit eventually employed some tactics to protect this woman who was being hunted by her husband. So when the king met with the warriors pressing for the uh, death, uh, ex ex execution of the, of the woman, King Prasenajit the first asked the warriors to do him a favor because he said, I've done you a favor because I gave you permission to kill your wife. Now, can you do me a favor? And when the husband agreed and he said, uh, he said this, um, he said, that warrior's wife, your wife, has now gone forth and thus is living a brand new life. So she's no longer that warrior's life, meaning she's a new person. The wife that you've been hunting for and wanted to kill is no longer there because she's a new person. And, and so by doing so, um, King Prasenajit was able to save this woman. In a later development of this, um, you know, of this view of um, clerical immunity, the redactors of the Buddhist monastic law um, even portrayed uh, Indian kings as judges who would be willing to bend existing laws to exempt the pre-ordination crimes of ordained Buddhists. For instance, um, in the Chinese and Tibetan translation of this text, Mula Sarva Sivada Vinaya, we read that um, King Prasenajit let his preference for protecting ordained Buddhists override a law that requires extreme punishment for women who failed to observe the virtues or who have broken the state law, meaning um, if a woman had an affair with another man, and in this case, the woman should be um, um, sentenced to death. Okay, in the Chinese, tr uh, in the Chinese transla uh, translation of this text, the woman of a general committed adultery, so her husband went to see uh, King Prasenajit and successfully requested the king to promulgate the following law. So the law says, if a woman failed to observe the virtues of a woman and insulted the law, she should be punished with an extreme penalty. So that's one part of the story. And at a later time, a general's daughter broke this law. And so her husband requested King Prasenajid to kill his wife in accordance with this existing law. So, you know, this, this woman did, did the same thing. You know, she fled to the um, uh, Buddhist monastic community and so and was able to successfully obtain ordination to become a Buddhist nun. And in this case, um, her situation was also further reported to King uh, Prasenajit. But in this case, King Prasenajit faced a dilemma because if he had the woman killed, then he would be perceived as a king who is incapable or unwilling to protect Buddhism. But if he released the woman, because she has committed an offense and which is a crime which is against an existing law. So if she released her, this will, you know, um, this will affect or diminish the authority of the law that he himself had already um, existed. So what he ended up doing was he had an honest conversation with this woman's husband and um, and asked the husband to forgive his wife. But the husband said, you know, he he reacted by questioning the king and he said. The established strict law was made known to all. And why would the king go against the law to release this woman? So King Prasenajit still decided to release the woman and argued that the existing law is applicable only to the others, meaning not, they're not applicable to the ordained Buddhist monks and nuns. 
And in a similar case pre um, preserved in the Tibetan translation of the same text, the Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya, King Prasenajit asked the soldiers who were hunting for the adulterous woman not to cure her, not to kill her because she had now again became an ordained Buddhist nun. The soldiers questioned the king and asked why the king was willing to act against the existing law to protect the women. And the king just told the soldiers, it is better to protect ordained Buddhist than uphold the state law which is a bold statement. But again, you need to understand who wrote these stories and who interpreted it is the redactors of the Buddhist monastic law texts. Okay. And moving into the second part about what, what, hap what will happen to post-ordination offenses or, or crimes. When discussing the post-ordination offenses of ordained Buddhists, the redactors of Buddhist monastic law texts tried to dissuade uh, or prevent lay people from suing ordained Buddhists in the lay court. And so basically they say the same thing, don't sue. Lay people, please don't sue ordained Buddhist monks or nuns. Um, they did so by emphasizing the possible consequences of losing a case. And we find one example in the uh, Dhammaguptaka Vinaya. And um, so the story goes like, um, in the kingdom, on the Vulture Peak Mountain in the kingdom of, of Rajagraha, there was a, a group of um, six nuns. And they do something really weird. And so they would pour buckets of night soil outside of the fence of their residence. So one time, a minister was on his way to greet uh, King Bimbisara. And when he was passing the nuns' resident, um, he was hit by the excrement the nuns were pouring outside of their fence. So his clothes became soiled and he was really angry and he wanted to um, bring these nuns to the, um, the lay court. But a Brahmin friend of this minister learned about his plan and said, don't, don't go. Because his friend told him, if you bring these nuns to the court and if you failed to convict them, you will be in great trouble. So this minister was persuaded and he eventually he gave it up. And instead, his Brahmin friend went to talk to the nun, did a little investigation, found out who did it, and just admonished them, please don't do that again. So basically the advice is, when ordained Buddhist monks and nuns are the troublemaker, the uh, clerical immunity on post-ordination offenses for ordained Buddhist monks and nuns studied with a general objection to corporal punishment. And we find this criticism in, the, um, in texts like the Mahasangika Vinaya. In the section on, on taking what is not given or on stealing, a Buddhist monk by the name of Danika stole timbers from Kim Bimbisara's storage house. Um, he wanted to, because he, want, he needed timbers to build his living quarters. And when this theft was exposed, Kim Bimbisara concluded that as a king faithful in Buddhism, even though you know, um, Mark Danica committed, did something wrong, the king said he could not punish an ordained Buddhist. And so he just released Mark Danica without punishing him. And in Mahasangika, uh, in the same text, the king further, the text further explained, why would King Bimbisara treat um, Mark Danica in this way? So it listed four different reasons. And first, this text declared that imposing Corporal punishment on anybody is an evil deed, is an evil practice. And second, it cited a precedent saying that Kim Bimbisara not only forgave Monk Danica in this life, but also in his previous life, um, Kim Bimbisara also forgave um, the person who was um, Monk Danica in their previous life. And third, um, Kim Bimbisara released the convicted Monk Danica because being an ordained Buddhist wearing the monastic robe itself is already um, an act that will automatically accumulate merits. So just by being an ordained Buddhist monk itself, it's something that will help to accumulate merit. And for that reason, he doesn't want to punish him. And lastly, the text also talked about the danger of casually imposing um, corporal penalties. So there was like one case about this where when um, when a Brahmin couple accidentally killed um, uh, an animal that had just saved their son, but you know the Brahmin couple was assuming that this animal had eaten their son, so he killed the animal. But afterwards, he found out that the animal was ac actually innocent, and in, instead of killing his son, the animal had saved his son. But he, you know, he didn't wait, and he hastily imposed 
death penalty. So this story was used in this text to say that corporal imposing corporal punishment is bad because if you, uh, once an execution is, is performed and if you found there was a mistake, there's no way to restore, to make up for the mistake. Okay, so after that, the um, redactors of the um, Buddhist text, they proposed two specific requests for clerical immunity from uh, corporal penalty. And the first one is discussed in a text known as the Ten Wheels Sutra. And this text has been preserved in at least uh, three versions. We have two Chinese translations and one Tibetan translation of this text. And central in this request is the need to avoid imposing penalty on ordained Buddhist monks who had broken their monastic vows. And the request was justified with some metaphors, which the text was saying, when an ox or deer die, they may produce ox bezoar and deer musk, and burnt incense can still emit fragment uh, smells, and therefore, even when an ordained monk or nun has, has made a mistake, had committed a crime, they are still better than ordinary layperson or they're still better than the non-Buddhists. Because, you know, an incense, when it is burnt, it still, you know, has a smell, okay? And the text then summarizes its point with a verse um, as following. It says, although the yellow jade orchid is withered, it's, it is still better than the other flowers. Ordained Buddhist monks who had broken their vows and performed the evil deeds are still better than all the non-Buddhists. And after raising this request to avoid imposing corporal penalty <coughs> on ordained Buddhists, the text further cited stories of the white elephant with six tucks, which I have explained elsewhere in, my, in, uh, in some of my upcoming writings. So basically, they made this request to say, you should never punish any ordained Buddhist. And they also used the stories uh, to illustrate why this is necessary. Um, so for example, in the, uh, in the Ten Wheel Sutra, the king was reported to be really impressed because um, uh, a maddened wealthy elephant that was often used to, um, to kill criminals convicted of, deadly, of, of uh, serious crimes refused to hurt a criminal who had a piece of cloth uh, wrapped around his neck who looked like an ordained Buddhist. So the king was very impressed with this story and eventually he decided he was reported to have promoted the following uh, law in his country. So the law says, from now on in my kingdom, all of those who assault, bully, or hurt ordained Buddhists, regardless of whether these ordained Buddhist monks and nuns were you know, observing the vows, have broken them, or they have never um, observed any vows at all, anybody who dare to hurt any of those ordained Buddhist monks and nuns, they would be severely punished with death penalty. So nobody is allowed to hurt any ordained Buddhist monk or nun. And, and after this, they made an additional request. And in this request, they requested for uh, an expanded set of privileges. And this time, not only clerical immunity from corporal penalty, but also um, immunity from um, economic punishment as well. So, and this has been discussed in another text, this, the Satyaka Sutra, which has also been preserved in at least three versions, two Chinese translation and also one Tibetan translation. So in this text, um, we read that there was an Indian king whose name is Chanda Pradyota uh, from the kingdom of Ujjayani in southern India. He consulted a Buddhist monk by the name of Mahasatya Nirgananta on how to govern his country. So during their conversation, this Buddhist monk Mahasatya informed the king that if there is an ordained Buddhist monk who had shaved, in ha shaved his head and is wearing the dyed monastic robe, whatever he does, it is fundamentally wrong for a ruler or any law enforcing personnel to impose any labor duty on that monk or to force him to remove his monastic robe to return to laity or to take that monk's life. Mm -hmm. So now we've Known that you know the um, the Buddhist has expressed in this monastic text these two requests. Basically, you should never, un under any circumstance, punish any misbehaving monks and nuns. So, how did Buddhist and scholars in Tibet and China responded to these requirements? The Ten Wheel Sutra uh, was 
apparently very popular in China. So in Dunhuang, at least 26 fragmentary uh, manuscripts on the of the Chinese translation of the Ten Wheel Sutra are found uh, there. In 2014, the Chinese scholar Wang Huiming identified two mura paintings depicting the story from the Ten Wheel Sutra, uh, respectively in the Dunhuang Caves 321 and 74. One of them depicts the story of the six tax relevant here. Um, for example, you can see here, um, you know, the there were five persons, looks like um, ordained Buddhist monks, but indeed they were hunters um, who had come to this mountain to hunt for the task of the two um, elephant, uh, elephant kings. So, but eventually the, these two elephants, because these hunters looked like ordained Buddhists, and even when these hunters had uh, after they have shot, you know, poisoned arrows towards uh, at the two elephants. The two elephants decided to forgive them because they looked like ordained Buddhist monks. Um, so this is interesting because there is a strong um, campaign for clerical immunity in this text, and this text was popular. It has widely circulated. We found multiple co multiple copies in the Dunhuang Cave. But when I look for records of how you know, Buddhists in China might have engaged with the campaign for uh, clerical immunity in the Ten Wheel Sutra, I was very puzzled because um, we had two eminent monks in the early time. So one of them is Xuan Wan, the other, of, uh, the other one is Xuan Zhang, Xuan Zhang. Both of these two monks, they had interactions with the Tang emperors, but they've never cited anything from the Ten Wheel Sutra to support their plea um, to the king. For instance, before he died in 636, Monk Xuanwan submitted a memorial asking Emperor Taizong Li Shiming to prosecute cases involving ordained Buddhists. Um, in, um, okay, yes, so he asked the emperor to, um, to only prosecute ordained Buddhist offenders in accordance with the monastic law, not in accordance with the state law. And about 20 years later, in 655, uh, this other monk, Xuanzang, also submitted a, a memorial asking Emperor Gaozong Li Zhi to stop the lay law enforcement personnel from beating ordained Buddhists in the lay court. So th the puzzle for me is, None of them, none of the two monks, either Xuan Wan or Xuan Zhang, had cited the discussion on the uh, clerical immunity in the Ten Wheel Sutra because this text tells you that as, an, as, an, as a ruler, as an emperor, you should never impose any punishment on ordained Buddhist monks. So they could have cited this text to back up their, um, their request. And the lack of reference to the Ten Wheel Sutra in Xuanzang's interaction with the uh, Emperor Gaozong is even more suspicious because Xuanzang was actually the person who had produced one of the two Chinese translations of the text. So he must be very familiar with the content of this text. Um, and at the moment, and I believe um, the early Tang monks' lack of direct engagement with the discussion on, th on the campaign for clerical immunity in the Ten Wheel Sutra was likely resulted from the fact that you know, this text, the Ten Wheel Sutra, was associated with the Street State School or the San Jie Jiao, which, is, uh, which was a Chinese Buddhist school that the, the state has declared to be um, an illicit organization at least four times uh, during, um, you know, in, the, in the seventh and, uh, and eighth century. And toward the later 7th century, um, a few more Chinese scholars, um, Buddhist scholars in China showed more engagement with this campaign for um, clerical immunity in the Ten Wheel Sutra, like this three. Um, but if we now move from uh, China to Tibet, in Tibet, the campaign for clerical immunity in the Ten Wheel Sutra had inspired many scholars to defend Buddhism and Buddhist in various ways. For example, some Tibetan writers cited the verses from the uh, Ten Wheel Sutra about you know, withered yellow jade orchid and also dead ox and deer. And they cited those verses to illustrate the importance and merit of taking ordination to become ordained Buddhist monks. Because if you've if you, you've been uh, ordained once as an ordained Buddhist monk, there's merit to that. You are no longer an ordinary lay human being. You would always be better than other lay persons, and also you would always be better than other non-Buddhists. 
And some others urged people, you know, cited those verses, urged people not to criticize ordained Buddhists who might have lapsed in their monastic vows. And, but only a few scholars used those um, um, passages from the Ten Wheel Sutra uh, to campaign for clerical immunity in, um, in Tibet. I can give you some examples here. For instance, in the 16th century, Pao Zula Chengwa, um, he's a Kamakagyu scholar who was critical. He was very critical on the early Kama, um, the Kadyu ruler's governance over the Buddhist community in Tibet. And so he cited the verses from the Ten Wheeled Sutra to advocate for clerical immunity uh, for text and other labor duties in this famous um, historical text, the Kibbe Garden uh, Scholar's Happy Fist. In this text, we read that the biography um, so it started with a conversation, an interaction between two figures. So the biography of Jasse, uh, Tome Bezambo, records that sometime between the fifth month of the ox year of 1361 and the tenth month of the rabbit year of 1363, um, Dai Situ Chan Chen from the um, Padrugaju lineage, he had invited Gyasi Rinpoche to come uh, to offer some uh, religious teachings in Zietang, located in the south of Lhasa. So while teaching at Zietang, Jesse Rinpoche was, you know, the guest. So he used the occasion, the opportunity, to plead Changchu Jiantan not to impose um, tax miniature services or cover labor on ordained Buddhists. And in reply, uh, Dai Situ Changchu Jiantan declined this plea, and he said the following. He said, I have been making offerings to ordained Buddhists who practice and behave in accordance with the religion. If I don't tax, collect tax on those who are you know, misbehaving monks and nuns, or peasants from the lower part of the valley, nomads from the upper part of the valley, or merchants, who else can I, can I collect tax? Who else can I tax? So basically, if you are well-behaving ordained Buddhist monks and nuns, I'm going to make offerings to you. But if you misbehave or made mistakes or committed crimes, I'm going to tax you. And you have to provide um, lab uh, du labor duties. Um, so then the conversation just went there, and Gassim Roche didn't say anything further. So this, um, but then, Pao Dula Chengwa, when he was writing the uh, Kibbe Garden um, uh, a Scholar's Happy Feast, he picked up on this interaction between Gassim Roche and also Dai Situ, and he made a comment saying that, um, you know, the tradition to um, collect, you know, to, to impose uh, taxed military service and cover labor upon ordained Buddhist is a legacy from the corrupted period in Tibetan history, um, you know, dated back to the ninth century, because that was a time when um, ordained Buddhist monks and nuns were mistreated. And so the, the tradition to collect, to impose tax on ordained Buddhist monks and nuns started from there. And he said, this is, this is a bad practice. And um, so then, um, Tsula Chengwa then cited the conversation between Gyasi and Dai Situ, and he also quoted verbatim that lengthy passage from the Tibetan translation of the Ten World Sutra, and he also used the metaphor um, equating ordained Buddhist monks who had broken, who had misbehaved to dead ox deer and withered um, yellow jade orchid who was, you know, and arguing that even when these monks had made mistakes, they are still better than the others. So then his argument was, so if the Ten Wheel Sutras tell us that even when a monk or nun misbehaves, you should never punish them, how could you possibly ever, as a ruler in Tibet, uh, collect and impose tax on well-behaving monks and nuns? Okay. And this was actually the most aggressive uh, engagement with the campaign for clerical immunity that I can find uh, in Tibet. And turning into the 17th century and 18th century, Tibetan scholars became less aggressive and they merely cited the verses on the yellow jade orchid in the Ten Wheel Sutra to discourage people from criticizing misbehaving monks. One such person is the fifth Dalai Lama. Um, in Tibet, the Gilubas the Gilu uh, adherents are known for advocating strict observance the, of the monastic vows. And personally, the Dalai Lama not only studied the text, the Ten Wheel Sutra, but he was personally very interested in the text. So he kept um, a, a toik, um, a record of the teachings that he had received from various teachers. And in this record of teachings that he had, re had received, he mentioned that he had studied the Ten Wheel Sutra, and he made a special note about the verses that I've just shown you. And, and then these verses from the Ten Wheel Sutra became particularly useful when the Fifth Dalai Lama tried to defend 
um, you know, to defend his twofold approach to protect the in integrity of the Buddhist clergy. And this twofold approach is explicitly elaborated in a commentary that he has written to explain difficult terms in the Pati Moksha that he had written in the year of uh, 1653. So in this two-fold uh, approach, on the one hand, the fifth Dalai Lama argued that it would be a heavy um, transgression for any lay person. Uh, sorry, first he argued that it will be a very heavy transgression for any ordained monk or nun to break the law. So basically, if you are ordained monk or nun, you know, behave well, don't break the law. And after that, on the other hand, he said something else. And he said, um, in his opinion, there are very few people who could observe the monastic vows impeccably. And for this reason, if people start examining every every single ordained Buddhist under the magnifying glasses measured by the letter of the Buddhist monastic law, and many of them would be found guilty of many different um, you know, transgressions. In other words, he said, there's no perfect people who is perfect in observing all the monastic rules. And instead, he believed that you know, ordinary lay people should just leave ordained Buddhist uh, monks and nuns alone. And he said this. Um, so he said, in this time, when most people behave as they please, if we conduct a detailed examination to see if it is if the behaviors of the ordained Buddhist is suitable or not in accordance with um, the uh, in accordance with the monastic law, then the shortcomings of many supreme and low individuals will be exposed. So basically, what he was saying is, if you check against every single ordained Buddhist monks and nuns, everybody is is going to be guilty of some kind of transgression, right? So his central argument in this passage is that people should stop scrutinizing ordained Buddhists by the letter of the Buddhist monastic law. And the fifth Dalai Lama cited the verses from the Ten Well Sutra showing that um, most ordained Buddhists have some kind of problems in their behavior, and thus ordinary people should not judge and criticize those flawed Buddhist monks even if they had committed severe um, offenses, they are still better by the standard um, set up in the Ten Wheel Sutra. So in this case, while the fifth Dalai Lama did not cite the verses in the Ten Wheel Sutra to argue for clerical immunity, and the verses did support him in discouraging people from criticizing ordained Buddhists who had transgressed their monastic vows. And the fifth Dalai Lama also um, his other strategy for defending the Buddhist clergy was to offer a suggestion because if there are ordained Buddhist monks and nuns who cannot live up to the monastic law, what should they do? And his suggestion was this, you should just go back, you just return to laity, you should you know, leave the monastic community. And that's the solution that he had uh, proposed. And in order to make this suggestion a viable and an attractive option, the fifth Dalai Lama first assured those who you know, could benefit from return to laity by saying that even after you have returned to laity, you would be still guaranteed, you know, you would be in the first row to be saved by the future Buddha Maitreya because you were once an ordained Buddhist monk or nun. And the third scholar that I want to introduce is, um, who was also interested um, in making a similar defense was this Amdo scholar, Shabaga Tsujun Ranjo. He, is, uh, he was a tantric yogic and also a, a, a poet from Amdo in northeastern Tibet. So he had extra expressed a strong resonance with the claim in the uh, Ten Wheel Sutra that committing transgressions against their monastic vows does not make ordained Buddhists comparable to an ordinary people because in um, he was, you know, he cited the, the verses from the Ten Wheel Sutra and criticized the lay people who disparage ordained <coughs> Buddhists who had made minor or major mistakes. So he wrote, he once wrote a poem, and in this poem he said, um, he was comparing, um, you know, he's, he was criticizing some lay people who, when they saw uh, a lama, you know, which is a, a, a Buddhist teacher in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, when a lama takes a woman as wife, then the lay people will lose their respect toward the lama. And he was criticizing this by saying, okay, this is his quote, I really love it. So he said, when peacocks eat strong poison, they become prettier, it makes them prettier. And what about, you know, but if a crow also eats strong poison, it will only kill them. 
What does that mean? So th he's comparing the lamas or the ordained Tibetan Buddhists to the peacock. They do bad stuff that will make them even more attractive. But if you are as, a, as an ordinary lay person, you also eat strong poison that will only kill you. All right? So that was his argument. So therefore, he considered it unsuitable for faithful lay Buddhist, uh, lay Buddhist to disparage any lama because when lay people, the other reason that he gave was very practical, and he said, lay people, when you are in trouble, and when you are in need of spiritual support or, and guidance when you are about to die, you know, those pure, good behaving lamas from far away, they, are, they will not come to help you. And only the flawed lamas in your local community will come help you. And for that reason, don't disrespect them. Okay, so, I mean, this is a very brief uh, introduction about how Buddhists in Tibet and China have responded to this campaign for clerical immunity that was expressed in um, early Indian Buddhist texts such as the Ten World Sutra. So in conclusion, I would like to um, um, make a few um, observations. So in conclusion, the legal rights restrictions and privileges of ordained Buddhists have been clearly discussed in early Indian Buddhist texts preserved in both Chinese and Tibetan translations. The general um, strategy is to uh, discourage litigations by or against ordained Buddhists. When litigation became unavoidable, the redactors of Buddhist legal um, and non-legal texts would advocate for lay rulers and law enforcement officials to grant clerical immunity from corporal punishment to ordained Buddhist offenders who are convicted of both pre- and post-ordination crimes or offenses. And this campaign for clerical immunity has been widely circulated in both China and Tibet through translated texts. However, in China, scholars have showed um, a significant reluctance in re-engaging with this campaign because you know, this campaign was uh, connected with a text, the Ten Wheeled Sutra, which was adopted as a key doctrinal text by the Three Street School, which was you know, um, a Buddhist organization that was declared as illicit by the, um, by the state in Imperial China. And in Tibet, scholars have primarily engaged with this campaign for clerical immunity expressed in the Ten Wheeled Sutra to discourage lay people from um, overly scrutinizing ordained Buddhist monks for all kinds of mistakes they may make, and that's it. And only Bao Zula Chenghua took it further, saying, because of what was said in the Ten Wheeled Sutra, then rulers in Tibet, look at it, you know, look, look up to it, and you should never impose any um, uh, text or you know, duty labors on the ordained Buddhist. And lastly, the last point that I want you to take away from this um, talk tonight is by saying that because the campaign for clerical immunity for, um, from corporal and economic campaigns are found in both the Chinese and Tibetan translations of numerous texts, such as, but, you know, including but not limited to the Ten Wheeled Sutra. So this campaign, as opposed, contrary to what Zhang Nati had been argued, because she was arguing that uh, she was only able to identify this campaign for clerical immunity in the translation of one, uh, one text, the, the, the Chandragapa Sutra. And she could not find a similar campaign for clerical immunity in the Tibetan translation of that text. So then her conclusion is that this campaign for clerical immunity did not exist. It did not start from India, but it instead it was added, inserted into the Chinese translation of Indian Buddhist texts by Chinese translators. So therefore, this campaign for clerical immunity does not have its Indian root, but it was a purely Chinese invention. But throughout the talk today, I hope I have convinced you that because the uh, discussions on the campaign for clerical immunity from corporal and economic campaigns are found in both the Chinese and as well as the Tibetan translations of, of numerous texts. And I argue that this campaign is indeed not a Chinese invention devoid of Indian origin, but instead key elements in this campaign for clerical immunity were already deeply rooted in the early Indian Buddhist texts. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.